Now, open your question paper and look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. Have you read any good novels recently? If so, look at the dust jacket or cover and see if there's a photograph of the author. If the novel's a recently published one, the chances are that the writer is young and good-looking. Judy, it hardly seems fair, does it? Youth, beauty and literary success? I quite agree. But it's a fact that the younger and more personable an author, the more promotable he or she is as a writer, with his or her image splashed all over the lifestyle sections of newspapers and magazines. Mm, perhaps the assumption is that we'll rush out and buy this person's works, hoping that, at the same time, some of his or her glamour will rub off on us. It hardly bodes well for the more mature authors, does it? Well, of course, older established writers deprecate this cult of hyping photogenic young newcomers to the trade, blaming publishers for their new ageist and lookist attitudes. They accurately point out that looks have nothing to do with writing talent. Writing is a craft that needs time to develop and it often takes around seven or eight books before an author really makes the grade. Indeed, and if we need further proof of this, we've only to scan the bestseller lists where, despite all the publicity that good-looking young new authors receive, the majority of writers featured are in their late 40s and 50s, with a string of successful works behind them. True. And, thankfully, real talent, as they say, will out. Having said that, it would be a mistake to accuse all newcomers of merely wanting to trade in on their success. Some wish to be judged on their writing alone. They don't all want to be seen just as a pretty face. Have you read any good novels recently? If so, look at the dust jacket or cover and see if there's a photograph of the author. If the novel's a recently published one, the chances are that the writer is young and good-looking. Judy, it hardly seems fair, does it? Youth, beauty and literary success? I quite agree. But it's a fact that the younger and more personable an author, the more promotable he or she is as a writer, with his or her image splashed all over the lifestyle sections of newspapers and magazines. Mm, perhaps the assumption is that we'll rush out and buy this person's works, hoping that, at the same time, some of his or her glamour will rub off on us. It hardly bodes well for the more mature authors, does it? Well, of course, older established writers deprecate this cult of hyping photogenic young newcomers to the trade, blaming publishers for their new ageist and lookist attitudes. They accurately point out that looks have nothing to do with writing talent. Writing is a craft that needs time to develop, and it often takes around seven or eight books before an author really makes the grade. Indeed, and if we need further proof of this, We've only to scan the bestseller lists where, despite all the publicity that good-looking young new authors receive, the majority of writers featured are in their late 40s and 50s, with a string of successful works behind them. True. And, thankfully, real talent, as they say, will out. Having said that, it would be a mistake to accuse all newcomers of merely wanting to trade in on their success. Some wish to be judged on their writing alone. They don't all want to be seen just as a pretty face. Extract 2 We're accustomed to synthesize music producing strange new sounds. It can also, however, take us back in time. 
In February 2000, a musical entitled Foss, written in celebration of the work of choreographer Bob Foss, opened in London, not with music of the millennium, but with the distinctive, if recreated, acoustics of Carnegie Hall, New York, in 1938. The finale includes Sing, 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 as originally performed by Benny Goodman and his band in January 1938, in a now-famous recording made utilising mics strung up high in the Echo Hall, linked to a lo-fi disc recorder on the other side of the street. In order to reproduce live, in hi-fi stereo, the tone of this original recording, the sound designer, Jonathan Deans, and the musical director, Gordon Lowry Harrell, employed modern technology. A synthesizer, with its sound fed into powerful loudspeakers around the theatre, mimicked the distant, resonant 1938 piano solo played by Jess Stacy on a concert grand. The original drum solo of Gene Krupa was reproduced on an enormous drum kit high up on centre stage, most of the sound reaching the audience directly, and the remainder being picked up by microphones at the stage front, which also captured the tap dancing. The result for the audience was a subtle mix of instant and after sound, simulating Carnegie Hall echoes. The result? A nostalgic pre-war musical time trip. We are accustomed to synthesise music producing strange new sounds. It can also, however, take us back in time. In February 2000, a musical entitled Foss, written in celebration of the work of choreographer Bob Foss, opened in London, not with music of the millennium, but with the distinctive, if recreated, acoustics of Carnegie Hall, New York, in 1938. The finale includes Sing, 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 as originally performed by Benny Goodman and his band in January 1938 in a now-famous recording, made utilising mics strung up high in the Echo Hall, linked to a lo-fi disc recorder on the other side of the street. In order to reproduce live, in hi-fi stereo, the tone of this original recording, the sound designer, Jonathan Deans, and the musical director, Gordon Lowry Harrell, employed modern technology. A synthesizer, with its sound fed into powerful loudspeakers around the theatre, mimicked the distant, resonant 1938 piano solo played by Jess Stacy on a concert grand. The original drum solo of Gene Krupa was reproduced on an enormous drum kit high up on centre stage, most of the sound reaching the audience directly, and the remainder being picked up by microphones at the stage front, which also captured the tap dancing. The result for the audience was a subtle mix of instant and after sound, simulating Carnegie Hall echoes. The result? A nostalgic pre-war musical time trip. Extract 3 The Australian David McKenzie, riding for the Linda McCartney Foods team, yesterday scored the first stage win in the Tour of Italy by a British squad, taking the seventh stage from Vasto to Taramo after being in the lead for 108 of its 113 miles. McKenzie broke away five miles into the stage, 24 miles from the finish. He held on over the final downhill kilometres, assisted by a tailwind, to win with 51 seconds in hand. The 25-year-old from Melbourne joined the McCartney team last year after two years with a small Italian squad, Cross, and won his national championship in 1998. He was one of only two riders from the original 1999 lineup to make it into this season. The McCartney team had a tough start, losing two riders, Olympic champion Pascal Richard of Switzerland and Australia's Ben Brooks, through a virus on the first day while the former British champion Matt Stevens had a nasty crash on the second stage. He was put in an ambulance, but forced the medics to let him return to the race to finish.
The Australian David Mackenzie, riding for the Linda McCartney Foods team, yesterday scored the first stage win in the Tour of Italy by a British squad, taking the seventh stage from Vasto to Taramo after being in the lead for 108 of its 113 miles. Mackenzie broke away five miles into the stage, 24 miles from the finish. He held on over the final downhill kilometres, assisted by a tailwind, to win with 51 seconds in hand. The 25-year-old from Melbourne joined the McCartney team last year after two years with a small Italian squad, Cross, and won his national championship in 1998. He was one of only two riders from the original 1999 lineup to make it into this season. The McCartney team had a tough start, losing two riders, Olympic champion Pascal Richard of Switzerland and Australia's Ben Brooks, threw a virus on the first day, while the former British champion Matt Stevens had a nasty crash on the second stage. He was put in an ambulance but forced the medics to let him return to the race to finish. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part 2. You will hear a talk about futurology. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. Good morning, everybody. It was, if I'm not much mistaken, Shakespeare's Macbeth who said that he could feel the future in the present. We may all be able to do that, but can we foresee the future with any accuracy? Futurology, as the art and science of predicting future developments is called, was hardly something to put your money on until the late 19th century. That was because before then, very little changed from one age to another. Even at the end of the 19th century, when futurology had caught on, it was little more than a parlour guessing game, except for a few visionaries like Jules Verne, who predicted submarines and rocket flights to the moon, and was vindicated during the 20th century. In the 1970s, with futurology a more reputable subject than in the past, forecasts tended to be more ambitious. As a taste of what was predicted, by the year 2000, food would be in pill form, TV would be hologram, and we would get around in our driverless cars or automatic personal planes. Hands up all those who already do all this. Right, now kindly get back to your own planet. Other predictions for the year 2000 were moving pavements and street escalators. Baker foil suits and a 20 hour working week. Sound familiar? Far less ambitious, but still wide of the mark, was the prediction in a 1971 World of Wonder magazine that by the year 2000, the increased number of motorways would mean fewer traffic jams and snarl ups. That's comforting to know as you sit in that three mile tailback on the start stop crawl towards your destination. Having said that, other predictions made as far back as the turn of the 20th century have proved fairly accurate. A set of French cigarette cards produced in France in 1899 and entitled In the Year 2000 predicted that air travel, motor cars, sound recording, helicopters, electric trains and home automation would all be important at the dawn of the third millennium. Specific predictions made after 1950 have sometimes proved to be on the cautious side, with Dr. Richard Cleveland foreseeing heart transplants within five years. 
That prediction was made in January 1967, but the first heart transplant was actually performed towards the end of that very year. World of Wonder, which gave us the roads we still do not have, in 1971 predicted satellite TV, Telstar, the first artificial satellite to relay TV pictures across the Atlantic Ocean, had been launched on the 10th of July 1962, and email. Meanwhile, Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock, also published in 1971, was rashly predicting cloned humans by the 1980s. Human alteration of the weather, artificial organ implants that would outperform real human organs, and undersea cities. Premature, to say the least, not to mention unrealistic. Unfortunately, nobody has brought on the clones. You still can't plan your holiday weather. Our hearts, ever in the right place, are still fallible flesh and blood. And who but the cast of Disney's The Little Mermaid would dream of living under the sea, even if that option were open? The future, you see, is, contrary to what many people think, not dependent solely on technology, but also on social, economic, political and cultural conditions. When changes come about, technology is merely the tool that makes them happen. Innovative ideas like the mini-disc, digital audio tape, and wristwatch TVs may sound great, but there have been too few takers to put them into mass production. There is simply no call for them. On the other hand, the CD and the cell phone existed 10 years ago, but nobody dreamed how widespread both would become by the year 2000. The notebook computer, though now a familiar enough object, was not even a twinkle in somebody's eye a decade ago. The answer to futurology lies, therefore, in society rather than in laboratories. It is not merely a matter of predicting the scientifically feasible, but rather the humanly and socially desired. I'll leave you with a quotation by Bernard Levin. The future is not what it was. Who can argue with that? Now you'll hear part two again. Good morning, everybody. It was, if I'm not much mistaken, Shakespeare's Macbeth who said that he could feel the future in the present. We may all be able to do that, but can we foresee the future with any accuracy? Futurology, as the art and science of predicting future developments is called, was hardly something to put your money on until the late 19th century. That was because, before then, very little changed from one age to another. Even at the end of the 19th century, when futurology had caught on, it was little more than a parlour guessing game, except for a few visionaries like Jules Verne, who predicted submarines and rocket flights to the moon, and was vindicated during the 20th century. In the 1970s, with futurology a more reputable subject than in the past, forecasts tended to be more ambitious. As a taste of what was predicted, by the year 2000, food would be in pill form, TV would be hologram, and we would get around in our driverless cars or automatic personal planes. Hands up all those who already do all this. Right, now kindly get back to your own planet. Other predictions for the year 2000 were moving pavements and street escalators, Baco foil suits and a 20-hour working week. Sound familiar? Far less ambitious, but still wide of the mark, was the prediction in a 1971 World of Wonder magazine that by the year 2000, the increased number of motorways would mean fewer traffic jams and snarl-ups. That's comforting to know as you sit in that three-mile tailback on the start-stop crawl towards your destination. Having said that, other predictions made as far back as the turn of the 20th century have proved fairly accurate. A set of French cigarette cards produced in France in 1899 and entitled In the Year 2000 predicted that air travel, motor cars, sound recording, helicopters, electric trains and home automation 
would all be important at the dawn of the third millennium. Specific predictions made after 1950 have sometimes proved to be on the cautious side, with Dr. Richard Cleveland foreseeing heart transplants within five years. That prediction was made in January 1967, but the first heart transplant was actually performed towards the end of that very year. World of Wonder, which gave us the roads we still do not have, in 1971 predicted satellite TV, Telstar, the first artificial satellite to relay TV pictures across the Atlantic Ocean, had been launched on the 10th of July 1962, and email. Meanwhile, Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock, also published in 1971, was rashly predicting cloned humans by the 1980s. Human alteration of the weather, artificial organ implants that would outperform real human organs, and undersea cities. Premature, to say the least, not to mention unrealistic. Unfortunately, nobody has brought on the clones. You still can't plan your holiday weather. Our hearts, ever in the right place, are still fallible flesh and blood. And who but the cast of Disney's The Little Mermaid would dream of living under the sea, even if that option were open? The future, you see, is, contrary to what many people think, not dependent solely on technology, but also on social, economic, political and cultural conditions. When changes come about, technology is merely the tool that makes them happen. Innovative ideas like the mini-disc, digital audio tape, and wristwatch TVs may sound great, but there have been too few takers to put them into mass production. There is simply no call for them. On the other hand, the CD and the cell phone existed 10 years ago, but nobody dreamed how widespread both would become by the year 2000. The notebook computer, though now a familiar enough object, was not even a twinkle in somebody's eye a decade ago. The answer to futurology lies, therefore, in society rather than in laboratories. It is not merely a matter of predicting the scientifically feasible, but rather the humanly and socially desired. I'll leave you with a quotation by Bernard Levin. The future is not what it was. Who can argue with that? That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Patricia Adams about energy conservation. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. This afternoon on House Help, we have energy consumption expert Patricia Adams to give us some tips on how to save kilowatt hours and precious pounds. Patricia, what advice can you give us? First of all, your hot water heater is probably the hungriest kilowatt consumer in your house. It's a good idea to reduce the thermostat setting to around 130 Fahrenheit. And if it's an older model, give it some extra insulation by putting a blanket of insulating fleece around it. 
You could also switch off the hot water in the morning, but do remember to switch it back on in the afternoon when the family needs water for showers and baths. Keep in mind that a shower uses less than half the hot water needed for a bath, so it's a good idea to save those long soaks for special occasions. Last of all, repair any hot taps that leak. Every drop you lose is costing you precious pennies. Hmm, what about in the kitchen? Oh, there are lots of things to watch out for there. Make sure you use pots which fit the size of the ring so you don't waste heat. And when you're baking or roasting something for which exact timing is not essential, switch off the oven a quarter of an hour before you plan to eat. Always defrost the fridge regularly. A freezer full of ice is far less efficient. And never put hot foods in the fridge or freezer, as the motor will have to work doubly hard to cool it down. Another money-saving idea is to heat water for hot drinks in a kettle, not on the cooker. And then keep the water in a thermos flask for later use. It will stay hot most of the day. Lights. What about lights? Lights are not big consumers of electricity, but of course it's simple common sense to switch off the lights in places where they're not needed. Dimmer switches allow you to control light levels and reduce power consumption, so they're very useful. Many people go for fluorescent bulbs, which do use less energy, but keep in mind that the more often you switch them off and on, the faster they'll burn out, so they could end up costing you more in the long run. Any other areas where people tend to waste electricity? Actually, yes. In the laundry. First of all, you should avoid washing small quantities. The machine uses the same amount of electricity and water irrespective of the load. So wait until you have a full load before washing. Use the economy setting on the washing machine whenever possible. And use cool or cold water for washing. Another way to cut electricity consumption when using an electric tumble dryer is to switch it off halfway through the programme and leave the clothes to dry in the warm machine for half an hour. Of course, the cheapest way to dry clothes is to hang them up in the basement, shared or, weather allowing, outdoors to dry naturally. This may take a bit more time, but it doesn't cost a penny. Well, thanks very much, Patricia. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate your advice when their next electricity bill drops through the flap. So, get busy switching off, but do stay tuned to Radio 1 for our next... Now you'll hear part three again. This afternoon on House Help, we have energy consumption expert Patricia Adams to give us some tips on how to save kilowatt hours and precious pounds. Patricia, what advice can you give us? First of all, your hot water heater is probably the hungriest kilowatt consumer in your house. It's a good idea to reduce the thermostat setting to around 130 Fahrenheit. And if it's an older model, give it some extra insulation by putting a blanket of insulating fleece around it. You could also switch off the hot water in the morning, but do remember to switch it back on in the afternoon when the family needs water for showers and baths. Keep in mind that a shower uses less than half the hot water needed for a bath, So it's a good idea to save those long soaks for special occasions. Last of all, repair any hot taps that leak. Every drop you lose is costing you precious pennies. Hmm, what about in the kitchen? Oh, there are lots of things to watch out for there. Make sure you use pots which fit the size of the ring so you don't waste heat. And when you're baking or roasting something for which exact timing is not essential, switch off the oven a quarter of an hour before you plan to eat. Always defrost the fridge regularly. A freezer full of ice is far less efficient, and never put hot foods in the fridge or freezer, as the motor will have to work doubly hard to cool it down. Another money-saving idea is to heat water for hot drinks in a kettle, not on the cooker, and then keep the water in a thermos flask for later use. It will stay hot most of the day. Lights. What about lights? Lights are not big consumers of electricity, but of course it's simple common sense to switch off the lights in places where they're not needed. Dimmer switches allow you to control light levels and reduce power consumption, so they're very useful. Many people go for fluorescent bulbs, which do use less energy, but keep in mind that the more often you switch them off and on, the faster they'll burn out, so they could end up costing you more in the long run. Any other areas where people tend to waste electricity? Actually, yes. In the laundry. First of all, you should avoid washing small quantities. The machine uses the same amount of electricity and water irrespective of the load. So wait until you have a full load before washing. 
Use the economy setting on the washing machine whenever possible and use cool or cold water for washing. Another way to cut electricity consumption when using an electric tumble dryer is to switch it off halfway through the program and leave the clothes to dry in the warm machine for half an hour. Of course, the cheapest way to dry clothes is to hang them up in the basement, shed or, weather allowing, outdoors to dry naturally. This may take a bit more time, but it doesn't cost a penny. Well, thanks very much, Patricia. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate your advice when their next electricity bill drops through the flap. So, get busy switching off, but do stay tuned to Radio 1 for our next... That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which different people are talking about their experiences of sports and exercise. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, Choose from the list A to H what each speaker says about the effects of sports or exercise on their bodies. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H how each speaker felt about doing sports or exercise. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 4. Speaker 1. There's no doubt that being a gymnast and competing in national competitions is very stressful for young people. I was only 13 when I started doing competitions. You had to watch what you ate all the time, and our team coach used to weigh us nearly every day. So it's not surprising that I ended up with anorexia. It got to the point where I realized I would have to give up gymnastics and concentrate on being healthy. I was a little disappointed that I never got to international level, but I just wasn't cut out for it. Speaker 2 I loved playing American football at college. It's a great game requiring speed, strength and skill. As part of my training, I worked out in the gym and did a lot of running to build muscle. I also used to eat a lot and drink protein supplements. In the end, I had to stop playing because of a knee injury. I was devastated about it, but my career on the field was over. Since my playing days, I've had to be very careful about what I eat. I'm not burning calories like I was, and I put on weight very easily. Speaker 3 To have the stamina to compete in the heptathlon means always being in peak physical condition. After years of constant training, it just became a habit to exercise and one that I never completely gave up, even after I stopped competing in athletics. I'm nowhere near the level of fitness I was then, but I'm still very fit. And that's just the way I like it. I do a lot of running, cycling and swimming as well as working out in the gym. I can't imagine not being in good physical condition. It's part of my life, and I love being fit and healthy with loads of energy. Speaker 4 For years I was a couch potato. Then I went for a medical and my doctor gave me a huge lecture about being overweight and leading a sedentary lifestyle. He said that sitting around was an open invitation for heart disease, diabetes and cancer. At first it was really hard. I didn't enjoy working out at the gym and going for long runs was boring. And then I discovered badminton. It's actually quite a fast game and it really keeps you fit. But the main thing is that I enjoy it. I don't see playing just as a form of exercise, but as entertainment 
and part of my social life with the added bonus of having made me physically fit and healthier. Speaker 5 I believe in moderation in everything, and that includes exercise. I like to be active, but I think a lot of people go too far and become obsessed with their bodies and exercise. I had a friend who went to the gym every day for three hours. It took over her life. I don't want bulging muscles and joints crippled by arthritis, thank you very much. I do enough aerobic exercise to keep in shape and that's it. I could be fitter and slimmer, but I'm perfectly normal and happy as I am. There's more to life than continually worshipping your body. I think too many women have been brainwashed. It's okay if you don't have the perfect body. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. There's no doubt that being a gymnast and competing in national competitions is very stressful for young people. I was only 13 when I started doing competitions. You had to watch what you ate all the time, and our team coach used to weigh us nearly every day. So it's not surprising that I ended up with anorexia. It got to the point where I realized I would have to give up gymnastics and concentrate on being healthy. I was a little disappointed that I never got to international level, but I just wasn't cut out for it. Speaker 2 I loved playing American football at college. It's a great game requiring speed, strength, and skill. As part of my training, I worked out in the gym and did a lot of running to build muscle. I also used to eat a lot and drink protein supplements. In the end, I had to stop playing because of a knee injury. I was devastated about it, but my career on the field was over. Since my playing days, I've had to be very careful about what I eat. I'm not burning calories like I was, and I put on weight very easily. Speaker 3 to have the stamina to compete in the heptathlon means always being in peak physical condition. After years of constant training, it just became a habit to exercise and one that I never completely gave up even after I stopped competing in athletics. I'm nowhere near the level of fitness I was then, but I'm still very fit. And that's just the way I like it. I do a lot of running, cycling and swimming as well as working out in the gym. I can't imagine not being in good physical condition. It's part of my life and I love being fit and healthy with loads of energy. Speaker 4 For years I was a couch potato. Then I went for a medical and my doctor gave me a huge lecture about being overweight and leading a sedentary lifestyle. He said that sitting around was an open invitation for heart disease, diabetes and cancer. At first it was really hard. I didn't enjoy working out at the gym and going for long runs was boring. And then I discovered badminton. It's actually quite a fast game and it really keeps you fit. But the main thing is that I enjoy it. I don't see playing just as a form of exercise, but as entertainment and part of my social life with the added bonus of having made me physically fit and healthier. Speaker 5. I believe in moderation in everything, and that includes exercise. I like to be active, but I think a lot of people go too far and become obsessed with their bodies and exercise. I had a friend who went to the gym every day for three hours. It took over her life. I don't want bulging muscles and joints crippled by arthritis, thank you very much. I do enough aerobic exercise to keep in shape, and that's it. I could be fitter and slimmer, but I'm perfectly normal and happy as I am. There's more to life than continually worshipping your body. I think too many women have been brainwashed. It's okay if you don't have the perfect body. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there is one minute left, so that you're sure to finish in time.